This is our Sunday School lesson for July 3rd, 2016. It is from Unit 2, titled, A World Gone Wrong. Uh, this is Lesson 5, and in our Faith Pathway Adult Study Manual, the title for the lesson is, Matching Words with Actions. And then in our standard uh, lesson commentary, uh, the same lesson is entitled, Needing More Than Law. Our devotional reading is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 23. Our background scripture is Psalms number 104. Also, Romans, the second chapter, verses 14 through 29. And then our printed passage is Romans, the second chapter, verses 17 through 29. And our key verse is Romans, the second chapter, verse 13. Not hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Our lesson's aims are first to state the difference between knowing God's law and obeying God's law. Number two is contrast the person who knows more of God's law but does not obey with the person who knows less yet does obey. And then last, repent of failure to act on what he or she knows of God's law. The two titles of our lesson today sets the stage or creates the, uh, the significance of the study of our lesson, matching words with actions and needing more than law. Our lesson is centered around, basically, if we would summarize it, is walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Um, Paul is being uh, confronted with uh, addressing Jews who um, somewhat displayed an attitude that uh, they were righteous by the mere fact that they were Jews and by their knowledge of the law of Moses. Um, and Paul was uh, addressing that it takes more than just knowing the law or being able to recite it verbally, but living it is the requirement that God places upon not just the Jew, but also the Gentile. Um, and at this uh, beginning of the spreading of the teaching through the uh, colonies or the area under Roman uh, domain or Roman control, uh, they were encountering uh, believers, Jews, as well as non-believers, Gentiles. And Paul is bringing... Uh, a very upfront and personal accusation against those who call themselves Jews um, and identifying their lack of practicing matching words with action, their lack of practicing what they teach, what they instruct, and what they recite. And so as we look at our lesson today, it is a recommendation that while we study it, read it, and verbally discuss it, that we also ask ourselves, are we like the Jews of that day, 
or are we like the Gentiles that Paul raises as contrast uh, to the learned Jews of the law as an example of what God is really looking for? What is the intent that God is seeking? Let's read uh, the verses, and I'm reading from the NIV, uh, verses 17 through 24. Just to see the things that Paul lifts, and then let us uh, judge for ourselves uh, the characteristics and the behavior uh, if Paul is justified in raising these questions. Verse 17, now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, our commentary reads that we cannot help but notice Paul's sarcastic tone throughout these verses. Literally, he was saying that his fellow Jews believed by definition that they knew what it meant to be righteous. Now, as we entertain the scriptures here, uh, the Jews bragging about their relationship with God, feeling superior because they were instructed by the law, uh, convinced that they were guides to the blind, that they were a light to those that were in the darkness. Uh, as we look at these things, um, let, let's entertain along with this, uh, the scripture found in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, uh, just for us to uh, raise some other concerns, and these are from the teachings of Christ um, out of the 23rd chapter of Matthew, and uh, I will begin it at verse 24. And it reads, Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. I'm going to pause right there. It's something that a lot of times we find people in uh, positions of uh, leadership, and some of us don't have to be leadership of anything, uh, but we somehow uh, find ourselves engaged in discussing issues that are of very little significance. Uh, but we place a lot of emphasis on things that are significant or insignificant when we looked at the problem at large, when we look at the issues that are before us, many times we waste a lot of unnecessary time discussing little immaterial issues and making them larger than life while the real issues of life are passing us by while we're engaged in little small battles. But the scripture goes on and it says, 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Now, we seem to be very good at displaying or presenting ourselves in a certain light that somewhat uh, says that we are what we say we are. We are good at costumes. Um, there's a, a song that talks about the uh, masquerading, that we're good at masquerading ourselves, like performing as actors. Uh, and the scripture just referred to it as being hypocrites. Because although we display one demeanor, the real essence of our being emanating from within ourselves is an altogether contrast of what we portray to others. We uh, have a, a practice that we call first impressions. And when you are uh, just being introduced to someone or you're just being um, uh, announced as uh, a person who is taking a new position or such or even in our personal relationships uh, meeting people as friends and such uh, we try to create this first impression and a lot of times the first impression is not true to the person who's revealing it. So the scripture referred to them as being hypocrites, uh, saying or portraying one thing, but really being something else altogether. And it goes on and it says, blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish that the outside of them may be clean also. If we could do as much preparation that we give to our outside, if we would spend just as much time and put forth just as much effort as we give to our outer appearance, if we would exercise the same fervor and the same dedication to our inside, then the scripture is telling us that that same effect, that same effort that we have displayed on our outside, if we would give that much attention to the diligence and work needed on our inside, it would automatically change our outside. As a matter of fact, as we go through the lesson, the whole inference of what Paul was trying to get across to the Jews was to end the hypocrisy, stop uh, masquerading, stop pretending, do that work on the inside and get that inner person clean, get that inner temple clean. Flush out all of that dirty laundry and what we have on the inside. If we just do that, the outer appearance will automatically change. It goes on. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to the scribes and the Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. We are, we are 
very keen in our efforts to do the things that are seen with the naked eye. And it's unfortunate because these are the things that become impressionable. And so therefore, we spend a lot of time on the outer things because it is easy to, to uh, create a delusion because so much, especially in our day and time, now this same behavior, this uh, human fallacy here, this same behavior was lifted even in biblical times, but especially in our times through social media uh, advertisement. We are constantly trying to persuade and influence people by a image. And it is as though as long as the image is pure, as long as the image is accurate, then what the image represents doesn't have to be as accurate or as pure or as clean, as definite as the image. So therefore, we stand in positions of leadership as the scripture was speaking about the blind, leading the blind, and then questioning us in our instruction, what we are teaching those who are looking to us in whatever position of authority or leadership we find ourselves. If we are the oldest of the siblings, uh, if we are parents, uh, if we are relatives of wisdom, uh, not just always focusing on our positions in the secular world. If we're supervisors, if we're directors, if we are uh, uh, CEOs, if we have hundreds of people serving under us, but not just what we do in the work world, but also what type of display in character do I give to those who are in my immediate family? Uh, sometimes uh, we have accolades attached to us uh, from that masquerading facade that we display in other areas of our life and our family members don't even recognize the things that are said of us because they say, hmm, that's not the Leonard that I know. <laughs> so uh, as we look, it's one thing to, and this is one of the practices of the uh, Jews in that day, is, is one thing uh, to have things said of you uh, in your uh, surroundings, uh, those that you are in association with. But it's another thing when people can see straight through that outer apparel that you have on. When they can see straight through it and see to your core and recognize that they say one thing, but they do something else. They talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And... When those types of individuals are in a position of service, which is the highest name that any of us can have, is the title of a servant. Not a slave, but a servant. Not someone to be manipulated and taken advantage of, but someone who serves to bring the betterment of the people that are under their service, that are the recipients of their service, to bring the betterment of them out of them. So the highest calling is that of a servant. And that is why the emphasis is so accurately attached to the Jews of that day. Because while they were very proud to have the position they had they had forsook and neglected 
the responsibility, which was, is that rather than attracting and drawing people to them, they begin to cause conflict and to create dissension because people begin to say, if that is what one who knows the law of God and studies it, and if that is what righteousness looks like, then certainly that's not what I want. Because if that is supposed to be the example, then the example has flaws. Well, therefore, why would I want to become what that is? Because I can already see the error in it. Which also is, as we are looking for examples, look unto God, not unto man. Look unto the things of God and not unto the things of man. Let us go further. We want to look at another part of uh, the lesson, uh, which speaks about obedience is better than sacrifice. Uh, this was lifted by Samuel uh, speaking to Saul in 1 Samuel, the 15th and the 22nd verse. Uh, it lifts a clear point here. Uh, speaking of uh, certain ritualistic things that a lot of people get caught up into. What they do through religious ritualistic practices and because they go through the uh, formalities of the faith this is where their righteousness lies it's not based on what they uh, do from the spirit of God or from within their heart it's based upon the outward ritualistic practices so Samuel says to Saul in 1 Samuel 15 22 does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams Sometimes we get caught up into, I can compensate for my inadequacies by the larger gift that I give. So a lot of those in the biblical times, uh, Jews who were wealthier than others, they would bring in fatted calves and they would bring in the fatted lambs and uh, the ones that uh, again, something that appealed to the naked eye visually, it looked like, oh my God, look at how much they're giving. Oh my God, look at how large that gift is. Oh, they really love the Lord. Uh, but that same person offering that gift, going through the religious formalities was one who that was all they were doing in any kind of form of order. They were follow, following the ritualistic practices. So let's look here now at the 25th verse of our text for today. Because it focuses on uh, something that the Jews uh, held as an obstacle to accepting non-believers or the Gentiles in the practice of the faith. It speaks to circumcision and it says circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. Just going through a physical practice and circumcision def definitely has its purposes and its practice. Uh, but just because someone is circumcised certainly doesn't mean that they are uh, cleansed or that they are righteous, as we will see. It says, if those who are not circumcised, this is verse number 26, keep the law's requirements, 
will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? So those that have not followed through one of the major practices of uh, the Hebrews, which was a covenant that was set with Abraham to set the seed of Abraham apart from those who did not know the law. But if someone has not undergone this uh, physical practice of removing the foreskin from the male's reproductive organs, if this is not done, what does that say about that individual's spiritual conversion and also about the condition of that individual's heart? So it says, the one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision as a lawbreaker. So the one who is not circumcised, but they are doing that which the one who is circumcised should be doing their own action, their own character, their own behavior will condemn the act of those who say they know the law. It's a, it's an embarrassing thing when the one who is considered to be the practitioner of the faith is shown up by someone who has been condemned as not knowing the law, a non-believer, one who is a Gentile, uh, one who needs to be instructed, one who needs to be taught, one who needs to be shown the way. And yet that individual is the one who is shining light on the one who is in the position to, to, to provide the things that is said as ill character. This is why we should not accept these people. This is why we don't allow them to come here. This is why we have these barriers set up for them because they are this, they're that. And yet while they're given those accusations against a people they have chosen not to accept, they find themselves to also be guilty of the same charges. Now let's look at uh, a passage of scripture here because sometimes uh, this is some of the practice uh, that we find. Uh, this is out of Luke, the uh, 18th uh, chapter. And uh, it's a familiar passage. Uh, I'm going to start it at the 10th. Uh, verse. Uh, no, let's start it at the ninth verse and read through. Uh, this again is uh, from the word and the teachings of Christ. 18th chapter of Luke, beginning at the ninth verse. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And that's what we just spoke of. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. A lot of times we like to pump ourselves up. 
Uh, we like to tell people all about, oh, what I do. Uh, I, uh, I attend, uh, I belong to a social group and we see after the needy and, uh, we raise money and, uh, at my church, uh, I, I, uh, not only pay my tithes as I should, but I also, uh, bring additional offerings in. And I try to make sure that the needs of those less fortunate than myself uh, have been taken care of. But we never speak about our individual exchange one with another. Some people like to give uh, money to certain uh, social or community outreach, but they never you never find them in the community uh, engaged in a one-on-one -on -one activity where they are pouring out of themselves. They're given the time. They're given the counsel. They're, they are going through the ups and the downs of different individuals. It is easier to just write a check and make a donation. Now, we're not speaking uh, against that as though uh, that practice in itself is unjust or that practice in itself is unrighteous. But what we are saying is that can't become a scapegoat from removing ourselves from being involved in the serving of others. But... In this parable that Christ taught, it talks about how this Pharisee used the things that he considered were uh, acts of righteousness. Because the scripture opened up in the ninth verse and it talked about those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and then they despised others. They despised others based upon the things that they were doing. And so uh, we can't use those uh, opportunities that have been presented to us as a means of being able not just to be a recipient of God's blessings, but also to be one as, as though we are like a conduit to God's blessing. The blessing comes to us and through us to another. And so as we speak about the pride that was uh, established on a covenant made with God to set his people apart from others, that cannot be used as an obstacle to receive others into the faith. And just because I have been circumcised outwardly, does not mean that I have been set apart or cleansed inwardly. Sometimes we like to hold on to things uh, and let them become distractions. But the whole practice of the uh, surgical procedure of circumcision is that something is removed that was intended to be there for a period of time, for a purpose, to preserve something for a latter use. And sometimes we like to hold on to things and the things we choose to hold on to, we like to make those things bigger than life. But it was never intended in God's creation and in God's purpose for his will being fulfilled in us. The whole practice of circumcision is to remove something for the function and purpose of the male organ being used in reproduction, in procreation. So it is with God's law. It is that it should not become an obstacle it is something that is used to preserve us 
It is as though we are in a birthing process and at the time of God's will being fulfilled, then that covering, that foreskin is removed so that the function of God's intent in our will will reproduce and will bring forth additional seeds into the kingdom of God. But if we get stuck on the covering and then make it bigger than life, it impedes the continuance of life because we got stuck on something that God intended to be there momentarily and then have it removed so that the procreation would continue. So as we close today, we want to close on the last two verses, which speak without any interpretation needed. And again, it's from the NIV and it says, a man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly nor is circumcision merely an outward and physical practice. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. We hope that something that we have said through this lesson will shine some light in all of our lives and help us to go forward and to be that beaconing light uh, in a dark world. As our uh, scripture title for this unit uh, says, A World Gone Wrong. God bless you. God keep you is our prayer.